You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 92 of the Common Descent Podcast. What's on the docket today? Eggs. Eggs? Yeah, we're talking about eggs. Big topic. Yeah, this is a big topic. About mostly small things. Yes. <laughs> eggs, as many of you are aware, are where a lot, in fact, most young animals come from. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, we're going to discuss what is an egg, what makes up an egg, some of the variety, a little bit about the evolution, and then... A bit about what the fossils are like and what we learn from them. Yeah, this it seems like this might be a lot like uh, episode 88 about teeth. Yeah. Where it, this is a thing that many animals share. Or eyes. I was reminded of or eyes. eyes. Yes, episode 68. So yeah, we've got a lot to delve into for, for an overview of eggs. And this topic was requested by two of our patrons, Brett and Jim, and... Antonio, Holly, and several people when we were watching Godzilla 1998 uh, during our Netflix party. Oh, that's right. That's right. Thanks for all the requests, everybody. Yeah. As soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, right, because of all the giant Godzilla eggs. Yeah, because eggs came up during we that. We all started talking about <laughs> eggs. <laughs> we sure did. And then a bunch of people said, do an eggs episode. So we are going to do an eggs episode. But before, some announcements. I mentioned our patrons, Brett and Jim. Well, we have a Patreon. Sure That's do. That's how we have those patrons. And when you sign up to Patreon at a certain level, we like to shout your name out here on the podcast. So welcome Corbin, Shaquille, Morgan, and Wolfgang. Thanks, all. Yeah, welcome aboard and thank you for your support. Our Patreon helps us support the podcast. It funds the podcast completely mm -hmm. and also helps us do some extra things. It's what helps us go on the trips we've gone on. And it's currently helping us do a lot of research for hopefully new things we'll be doing in the near future, nearish yes. future. We have some plans and we've been doing some learning. Yeah. Uh, and some of that learning has indeed been funded by uh, the money on Patreon. So, so thanks, everybody. Thank you for all your support. And hey, speaking of trips that we like to go on, we're not going on a trip this year. We aren't, as many people are not going on trips this year. <laughs> uh, we mentioned this, I think, the last episode. Yes. But Dragon Con, which we have gone to as the podcast the last two years, is virtual this year. Yeah, it's we're not. We will not be doing Dragon Con in person because no one will be doing Dragon Con in person. <laughs> nope, it is not happening. But they will be doing virtual content. We don't have all the information, so we can't tell you exactly what it'll be like, but we will be participating. We sure will. So keep your ears out. Keep your eyes out. If you're if, if you're following the Dragon Con stuff, you know, keep up with their schedule, and we will be part of it. Yes, we don't have everything laid out just yet. We know we will be doing at least one thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're a fan of the podcast, keep your ears out. If you're a fan of our Silver Screen Science stuff... Keep your ears out. Hey. And speaking of upcoming things, we are rapidly approaching our upper numbers for the episodes and almost three digits. True, true. Which means we have two big episodes coming up, 95 and 100. And 95 we, is an extinction episode. It's an extinction episode, as we've mentioned in previous ones. If you have ideas for extinction episodes, let us know for 95. Send them in. And then 100's 100. That's a big number. And so it's kind of a big deal. It's our it's our centennial. Yep. <laughs> um, so if you have cool ideas for what we should do for our hundredth episode, let us know. We're we're slowly collating a list of ideas. Yeah, we're not sure what we're gonna do yet, but we are pulling together some schemes. So share those with us on social media, email, all the usual ways, and we'll be happy to hear them. And that's it for announcements, which means we can go on to the news. Every episode, we like to go over a little bit of the recent, you know, science news, uh, articles and discoveries and research on paleontology, evolutionary, biology, and similar related topics so that we can stay up to date and all of you can stay up to date. And to get us up to date, I'm going to hand it over to David. My first bit of news for this episode is about a very small reptile that tells us some things about very big reptiles. All right. All right. Yeah, man, man. This is research 
by Christian Kammerer et al. in the journal PNAS, and we'll link to an article in Scientific American by Laura Gengel, which is a name we normally associate with live science, but this time Scientific American. <laughs> Ornithodires. We've talked about Ornithodires at the very least in episodes 21 and 79, because Ornithodires is the group of archosaur reptiles that includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Yes. So kind of a big deal group, but their early evolution is not particularly clear. A little mysterious. As is the case with so many major groups, the early evolution we don't know a whole lot about. This new bit of research announces a new species, new specimen species, of early ornithodire from Madagascar. This is mid to late Triassic, about 237 million years old. The specimen was originally discovered in 1998 and has now finally been described and named Congonophon kelly, which uh, the, the name has a meaning. We'll get to that in a second. Now, early ornithodire, that's exciting because we don't have a lot of those. But the thing that is most stand out about this animal that the paper spends most of its time talking about is its size. Congonophon is estimated to have been full-bodied about 10 centimeters tall, or oh, wow. 4 inches, which makes it one of the smallest ornithodirons, that is, dinosaurs plus pterosaurs, one of the smallest ornithodirons that isn't a living bird. Yeah. This was a very, very small archosaur. Its tooth shape and the micro wear on the teeth, so the way that the teeth have interacted with their food. Now how they've been beat up suggests that it was eating hard-shelled insects. Okay. So it's a little insectivore. In fact, its name is a combination of Malagasy and Greek terms that means tiny bug slayer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name. Now, the size is really interesting because uh, when they compare it with other or early ornithodires that we have, the others are also pretty small. And for a while, you know, it's kind of easy to go, well, if we only have a handful, then... Maybe that's just what we've happened to find. But yet another one makes it seem like there may be a pattern going on here. Yeah, it's uh, every new specimen or every bit of data you add to the pattern makes it less of a coincidence and more of an actual trend. And so they did a phylogenetic analysis, a relationship analysis of ornithodires, and their analysis suggests that miniaturization was a trend early in the evolution of ornithodires, that they started out getting very small. This could be uh, potentially to exploit a niche that other archosaurs weren't doing, in this case, bug eating. Because if you can evolve, if you can adapt yourself well to bug eating, you, you are not going to go hungry. <laughs> Say, if you can benefit off the actually most successful group. Nature's trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> And if that's the case, this suggests that some of the largest animals ever started out from particularly tiny ancestors. Dinosaurs and pterosaurs are, respectively, include the largest walking animals in history and the largest flying animals in history. Which is pretty, pretty awesome. And it makes me think of, like, the Future is Wild documentaries where they would do something like that and they'd be like... I don't remember if they did it with rodents, but I know they did it with something similar where it's... Well, they did it with tortoise, uh, turtles. That's what it and was. they had the giant... They had the big sauropod tortoise. Yeah. Um, and I've seen other things that do stuff like that where it's like, you know, rats used to be small, but now 50,000 years in the future, now there's... J and a lot of times it feels like, ah, ha, ha, that's a funny thing that you did. But no. <laughs> no, in this case, that may actually have been a thing. There's no reason that can't happen, and it's pretty cool. That if you went to the mid-late Triassic and you saw these little, like, kangaroo rat archosaurs running around, and you went, ah, look at the tiny things. And then who would have thought? Now, they mentioned that there are some implications to the tiny size. One is that it might not be a coincidence that some of the descendants, in fact, many of the descendants eventually, evolved flight. Mm. That being tiny may have set the stage for pterosaurs specifically to have become flighted. And also, uh, as we've mentioned a number of times on the podcast, we keep seeing this evidence that pterosaurs and dinosaurs shared this feature of being fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And small animals have trouble retaining heat. It is much more beneficial for a small animal to be fuzzy in terms of holding on to heat than a large animal who is a, a furnace just building up heat because of their giant body. Mm -hmm. 
So it would make sense, we don't know for sure, that a tiny animal may have been a good place for both fuzzy heat retention and possibly flight adaptations to get started. Yeah. And it might also explain why we have so few early ornithodires. Not because they, not necessarily that they were very rare, although they may very well have been, mm-hmm. but also if they were really small, it may be that we have to look more carefully or acknowledge that certain environments aren't going to preserve them. Yeah, because tiny and fragile doesn't always preserve well in every fossil site. Yep. Neat. So wait, some interesting implications. I like the point that starting small may have opened the doors up for flight more easily because... If you're small, there's there's lots of... You're not nearly as constrained by physics right. as when you're giant. So there's there's a lot more wiggle room for it. It's like, yeah, you could, you could start parachuting really easily. What? How much do you weigh? Two tons? You can't parachute anymore. No, sorry. <laughs> Listen, you, you have advanced out of that tree. Yeah. That, that, uh, not a literal tree. Well, also a literal tree. Yes. But I meant like in a video game sense. <laughs> like, nope, that skill tree is no longer available to you. You chose this other option. Yes. And so <laughs> that's a really good point. Well, speaking of dinosaurs, my next news is also about dinosaurs. Oh, well, let's do it. A dinosaur to be specific, Dilophosaurus. Oh, I know that dinosaur. Yeah. It's one of my favorite dinosaurs, actually. I think this one's really cool, but also one of the ones I have to correct people on most often, which is part of what this article is about. Oh, good. That the history for Dilophosaurus, that's the two-crested predatory dinosaur that spits poison in Jurassic Park. Uh, So this is a dinosaur that in reality was like a 20-foot long animal or something. Yeah, go for it. You explain it. (laughs) So this is research by Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe in the Journal of Paleontology in an article by UT News that discusses a new examination of a variety of specimens, a couple, this is the first time they're being researched, that gives a more complete view of this dinosaur. Because Dilophosaurus has a lot of misconception around it due to a very famous film that portrayed it as a fairly small, frilled, poisonous animal, when in fact they were actually fairly large, robust, powerful predators with no evidence of frills or poison. Right. Which we already knew. Yep. All that isn't news. But there were other reasons that Dilophosaurus has not always been super well understood because its history is actually fairly muddled. The first Dilophosaurus specimen was discovered and published on in 1954. And that first specimen was partially rebuilt out of plaster. And the paper that described it... I have not read, but as the authors described, it is unclear when it's describing features, whether it's describing the bone or the plaster. Mm. And so there's features of Dilophosaurus that have been kind of in the books since then that have never really been clear if they're actually accurate to the dinosaur. Uh, For instance, originally they were described as having weak jaws. I have heard that. And a weak bite. And that's part of why... They were made poison spitters in Jurassic Park. It's like, oh, weak jaw, poisonous. Yeah. This new analysis, which included five total specimens, and then two of those five are, this is the first time they've ever been in a paper, that are from the, the Cayenta Formation in Arizona, and using an algorithm that they built off of the specimens by recording hundreds of characters on those specimens, they were able to find a few things. One, they were able to show that, no, these were pretty powerful predators, it seems, with a at least decent bite. There was evidence of muscle attachments for what seemed to be a strong bite on the jaw. So n- not weak-jawed. They were also able to confirm that all the specimens were indeed Dilophosaurus, because that was also slightly up to debate due to how murky the old publications were. <laughs> so a lot of things that we were calling Dilophosaurus, people were starting to question if they for sure were. This confirmed they were. They also found something interesting, which is in the skull and the crests on the head there were air pockets oh so dilophosaurus has these two like mohawks mo yeah it's like a double mohawk down down along the head yeah which would have helped to reinforce the skull it helps strengthen it's this these are very similar to the air pockets you see in birds and larger dinosaurs like sauropods and so this also supported that they would have had a actually strong skull and that the 
the jaws and the crest were not fragile, as had been earlier suggested. And they also noted that because the crest was pocketed with air spaces, it maybe suggests other uses for the crest. Birds use their air spaces in their bones for the structural support. They can also inflate stretchy parts of their skin into display structures. Right. Kind of like a frog's... Yeah. Uh, bulging its throat. Yeah. And they said that potentially if the crest has these similar structures, structures, maybe it was being used for another display thing. Yeah. Using those in application. Which would make sense for head crests. Yep. And then finally, it also, the algorithm helped them reveal a evolutionary gap between Dilophosaurus and its closest dinosaur relatives which indicates that there are probably more relatives of Dilophosaurus yet to be discovered that would fill that gap in. Interesting. That we don't necessarily have sort of the connecting pieces. Yeah, that we don't have the fossils that would, would fill in that family or that evolutionary line. Right, right. The earlier and, and adjacent members of it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is not like a, a completely rewriting Dilophosaurus, but clearing up some details and giving a little more clarity to how we view this dinosaur. It's it's always good to see when... There are a lot of dinosaurs that are very famous, mm -hmm. but became famous for reasons that are not that they were very well preserved. Like, <laughs> there are a lot of famous dinosaurs known from a single specimen or partial specimens, and then they become popular, even if they don't show up wildly fantasized yes. in, a, in a very popular movie. You, you get an image in your head of what these dinosaurs are like, and then eventually someone has to go in and go, okay, actually, though, there's a lot that needs clearing up on this dinosaur. There's a lot of questions left unanswered. Yeah. So it's fun to see a, a team do that. Well, and the really, the part I found fascinating is that not only did it clear up the image of the Lophosaurus, but this new view in this algorithm actually let them identify a specimen that previously was not known to be, be the Lophosaurus, or was suspected it at most and that uh it was a small brain case a small brain case that was thought maybe to be the off source and this algorithm confirmed it so yeah. by by bit quantifying the characters mm -hmm. of the known specimen and then saying yeah no the this has the same characters yeah and so they're hoping that now that we have a better view of this dinosaur we may be able to actually identify more specimens that may already be in collections oh very cool well that's fun stuff Hey, speaking of dinosaurs, my next bit of news is about dinosaurs. Hey! Specifically a dinosaur. <laughs> In this case, Microraptor. Cool. Uh, and new research that suggests uh, evidence for a molting pattern in Microraptor. I'm interested. Isn't that cool? This is research by Yosef Kiat et al. in the journal Current Biology, and we'll link to an article in Science News by Carolyn Gramling. Birds molt. They molt their feathers. Uh, uh, across modern birds in it uh, across modern birds this is a thing we see that adults molt their feathers at least once a year to replace them mm -hmm. basically you know it's similar to how we re replace our skin cells birds are doing it with their entire feathers there are different styles of molting that we see across birds though some of them molt all their feathers all at once yes others molt them gradually but sort of irregularly and then there are a lot of birds that use that, that that molt in a sequence. So, for example, the sort of irregular molting or all at once molting are always seen today in either flightless birds or flying birds who can't fly during molting. Yes. So there are birds like loons and cormorants who will start losing their feathers. And at a certain time of the year, they just lose their flight feathers and can't fly. Mm hmm. But a lot of birds experience what is called sequential molting, which is gradually losing your feathers in a specific pattern so that you never lose too many of them to be able to fly. Yeah, so that you're always functional. You're always functional. You lose them here and there, usually symmetrical on either side of the body, and the whole time you can still fly. Lots of birds do that today. Just for a fun fact for everyone, when they lose all the feathers at once, that's called a catastrophic molt. Yep. <laughs> and that's what penguins do. And if you ever want to see what a miserable penguin looks like, find one that's in a catastrophic molt. Yeah. Because they can't swim either. Sad penguins. This, they are super sad. <laughs> it makes me think of Fox, uh, the phoenix, Dumbledore's yes. phoenix, which mm -hmm. is a really catastrophic molt. 
genetic analysis has sought to basically understand how far back molting goes and suggests that molting, and in particular sequential molting, probably goes back to the ancestors of modern birds. Oh. Which seems to suggest that non-sequential molting is derived. Like, that has shown up more recently. Because if you're an ostrich or whatever, or a penguin, Mm -hmm. you don't need to be able to fly all the time. You can afford to have a little period of time where you can get away stuck on the ground. Yep. This new research, the authors claim to have found evidence of molting in the dinosaur Microraptor. So as a refresher for anyone who doesn't know the name, Microraptor is a Cretaceous, small, totally feathered, four-winged dinosaur. Yeah. Four wings, I mean it has wings as its arms and its legs. Yep. Long, aerodynamic feathers. There has been a lot of discussion and study on Microraptor to suggest that it was at the very least capable of gliding, possibly capable of actual powered flight to some degree. Not a bird, which means that Microraptor represents a separate origin of gliding or flight to birds proper. This study examines one specimen, early Cretaceous, with three feathers on one of its wings that appear to be growing primary feathers surrounded by fully grown primary feathers. The authors suggest that the the comparing these feathers to the feathers around it suggests that they were lost and in the process of being replaced in a similar way that we see modern birds will lose patches of feathers and then replace them during a slow, drawn-out molting process. If Microraptor had this sequential molting, as opposed to catastrophic molting or something, that would suggest that it needs to be able to glide or fly all the time. Mm -hmm. That this is an adaptation that is, you can afford to not be in the air whether it's for catching your prey or it's for escaping predators, that this was a key part of Microraptor's lifestyle and behavior. And it would also mark the first uh, known evidence of sequential molt in a not bird. And on top of that, suggests that sequential molting was present in at least some lineages 120 million years ago, almost twice as old as the common ancestor of modern birds. It's yet another thing, as we always like to point out, that was a dinosaur thing. Yep. (laughs) The bird things that we recognize as being bird things are dinosaur things. Now, I this is a super cool uh, conclusion, if true, but I did, I looked through the paper and I had a couple of questions that I didn't see answered in the paper. Oh. Uh, Far be it for me to to criticize these uh, accomplished authors, but I do wonder... They didn't have the other wing, the Um, wing on the other side. And they do mention that sequential molting tends to be symmetrical. So it looks like, so they couldn't confirm that this was present on both sides. And also a thing that I didn't see mentioned in the paper, which maybe they accounted for elsewhere, is how they know it didn't just lose those feathers. Mm -hmm. Like they didn't just get pulled pulled out out or something by something else. I may have missed it, but I, I, I would wonder how you would tell the difference between... Did these feathers just get lost and were now growing back? Or was it an in- programmed molting period? Yeah, yeah. That was by design and not by accident. Yeah. And I don't, know, I don't know how it works in modern birds. I don't know if there's a difference. Yeah, and it's, I, I don't know either. But they're good questions. And it is, it, it's a situation where there does seem like there could be potentially other answers for the evidence. Uh, not that it's molting seems like it's unreasonable yeah you know that makes sense uh it 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 seems at least to definitely make sense as much as the other potential answers so i'll be curious to see if there's more evidence of this out there to be seen Mm -hmm. and how widespread because they mentioned that there is evidence for molting in other dinosaurs okay but not sequential molting like they're suggesting here so I, I I don't know much about molting evidence in dinosaurs. Yeah. I hope we get to see more of it. Very cool. Yeah, that's that's the kind of discovery that is, as I've said in other news, is one of my favorites because that immediately fills in a bit of the lifestyle. Yeah. N- now we have an image of kind of what was going on with you during at least part of the year. <laughs> yeah, which 
and, and it's super cool. Although, had a, if I could choose, I would have chosen to have discovered evidence of a catastrophic molt. Yes. Because that is more fun to picture. Yes. Just a miserable micro Just a little naked micro raptor being all upset. Like, just climbing up the tree. <laughs> mm, mm. All right, cool stuff. Well, my next bit of news is not about a dinosaur. Oh. Yep, I know. Well, this is a paleontology podcast. Almost all four. Almost got it. This I mean, one... my first one wasn't a dinosaur either. Yeah. It was close. It was, you know, it, it was working its way there. All right. Is your next one at least close? Crocodiles. Uh, I mean, it's it's in the water with teeth. All right. Bring it on. You know, the closest thing to a crocodile is a dolphin, of course, right? Naturally. <laughs> Tell us your news. Naturally. <laughs> this is about an extinct dolphin that appears to be a a super predator dolphin. So think killer whale. Yeah, it has camouflage in the forest and it hunts down Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> this is research by Robert Bosnecker et al. in the current biology and the press is by Cell Press in, in Eureka Alert. So this is not a new species. Uh, this is Ankyloriza tidamani. And it was already known, but before this was only known of uh, partial material, uh, just part of a snout. So the rostrum. Okay. And now they have a better specimen that they've been able to get a more complete look at. So this new specimen, nearly complete, came from South Carolina. And with a full look at the animal, this was a big dolphin. So like 15 feet long. Whew. And would have been swimming around during the Oligocene. So about 25 million years ago. And as mentioned, appears to be a top predator so not going after smaller things but going after larger prey top of the food chain kind of animal based off of the snout head but also other features of the body but the interesting thing they noticed while looking at the overall anatomy is that it seems that a number of the features have been convergently or parallelly evolved with baleen filter feeding whales oh interesting so we talked in episode 41 whales whales about today there are two main groups of whales. The toothed and the baleen. So your baleen whales are all the whales that you typically think of when you say whale. Right. Blue whale, humpback whale, yeah. etc. I take big mouthfuls of stuff and then I strain out the food. While toothed whales are your dolphins, your orcas, your sperm whale. Yep. And they split a while back. It appears that a lot of the similarities evolved independently in the two groups within their body like the shape of their body for swimming interesting and some of these include the narrowing of the the tail stock so if you were to look at a dolphin's tail from above it's actually flattened like a wing since it goes up and down the part just before the fin is narrowed increasing the number of tail vertebrae is also a feature seen in both okay long tails mm -hmm. and then shortening the humerus your arm bone to make it a stocky locked in place flipper yeah. for steering I'm I'm imitating. Yeah, Will's the doing a, he's doing a great impression right it's, now. It's if you saw me you'd think a dolphin was here. The reason this is so interesting or seems to stand out cuz parallel evolution is not crazy unusual, but we they don't see it in other groups with very similar stories like sea lions and seals. Hmm. Who also share a lineage but evolved very different ways of swimming. Right, they diverged. They diverged while sea lions flap through the water with their front limbs and seals swim like a fish using their feet, like back and forth, not the way a mammal's supposed to. <laughs> no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And so this stood out as a very rigid case of parallel evolution when similar groups are showing very different evolutionary paths. So it was just an interesting note for this, this large predatory dolphin. Hmm. They were also able to learn some interesting things about the history or the pattern of toothed whales or mega predators in the ocean's history. And Kyloriza went extinct about 23 million years ago. It would have been potentially the first echolocating apex predator, predatory whale. Wow, that's cool. It started sounding like the predator more and more. Right? <laughs> but it went extinct 23 million years ago and then... Sperm whales and shark-toothed dolphins, which I don't, I didn't know there was a group called that. That's awesome. Evolved to refill that niche within the next five million years, and then after the last killer sperm whale, you know, the 
the ones with the monstrous teeth went extinct. About five million years ago, we see killer whales. Orcas. Orcas enter the niche. And so there's been this kind of dipping and refilling of that niche of a giant, large-toothed, apex predatory whale. Interesting. Echolocating as well. Changing of the guard among the toothed whales. Yeah. So this, this filled that pattern in in an interesting way. That's pretty cool. It's cool to know that this group of animals has been occupying this niche, not the same necessarily family. Yeah, exactly. But that there's always someone from this general group of whales. That's It, it reminds me of, uh, we talked in episode three, about how there have been at least three major regimes of sea snakes. Yes, yes, yes. And that each time it's been a different group of snakes that are the sea snakes. But that this, there are niches that... Once the, the 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 once the ecosystem has them, kind of stay open until they are filled again by a very similar group. Yeah, or at the very least, that group is always just close enough mm-hmm. to easily adapt back into that uh, that role. So yeah, this was just they found a good specimen that gave us a whole bunch of new interesting information. That's cool. Also, I, and I, this isn't a new thing, mm-hmm. but the fact that fossil whales are so well known from the southeastern United States, <laughs> yeah, that makes me so happy. Like, I it always takes me a little bit by surprise. I'm like, oh right, this, Basilosaurus is the state fossil in I think two states. <laughs> but that's really cool because it's so long. It's yeah, it it actually sits in <laughs> two states. <laughs> And that will bring us to the end of the news. Okay, that means... Eggs. Eggs. We can start talking about eggs. We've been quoting John Mulaney for over a week. Yes, because of preparing for this. (laughs) So, eggs. We're going to discuss what an egg is after the break. So the idea of introducing what an egg is feels fairly redundant compared to a lot of the things we talk about on this podcast. It, it feels like you should be able to start off and go, you know, eggs, moving cool. on. Cool. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> but eggs are almost fundamental to being an animal. Yeah. Uh, not There are animals that have forms of reproduction, you know, you, budding and things like that. Yeah. But for the most part... The vast majority of animal life, and if you count seeds as eggs, life. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and if you're talking at a cellular level, even we start off as egg cells. Which indeed is what an egg is. At the fundamental level, an egg is an ovum, which is the Latin term for egg. That is the egg, the female reproductive cell. And that's what an egg is. They get real fancy with some groups, but at the core, that's what it is. And that's where we start. That's the important aspect of an egg is that it is half the DNA to make a baby. Right. It is the counterpart to sperm. Exactly. The sperm cell, the gamete from the other side of the equation. Yes. Eggs typically are much larger than sperm and less numerous. Yes. And so that's the kind of the features that define an egg is that they are... Bigger and more important because they are going to actually do the job of growing into. Right. The egg will eventually become the baby. The the sperm or equivalent carries a little packet of info that basically includes the startup yeah, software. Yeah, it's the trigger. Yep. It's the triggering code. But other than that, the egg is the core to becoming a new animal. But you will also hear egg just used for... Everything that surrounds this ovum. Right. We got a few eggs in the fridge. Yes, exactly. And they can get, as I said, very complex. So let's go over the parts of an egg. Not all eggs have the same parts. Some have almost no parts outside of the cell. And others have so many parts. So many parts, we're not going to be able to go over them all. Right. Enough enough for several textbook diagrams. Yes, yes. (laughs) But... Starting with arguably the most important part of an egg, other than the the gamete, other than the the half the chromosomes, 
that become the baby is the yolk. The yolk, once again, you're probably familiar with, especially if you've ever had a a fried egg or a hard-boiled egg. It's the yellow part in the middle. The yolk is mainly nutrition, a little packet of food for the growing embryo. Right. But not all yolks are made equal. There's actually a vast variety. And that variety is grouped into three main categories based on the size and distribution of the yolk. You have the microlecithal eggs, which are small eggs with very little yolk. And typically the yolk is not in a little nice blob in the middle. It is mixed in with the cytoplasm, the goop of the egg. And it's just distributed among the fluids inside the egg. Okay, interesting. These are very common in your invertebrates. All right, so like insects, aquatic things. No, insects actually get fairly fancy eggs. Oh, I, you know, as soon as I said <laughs> it, I was like, no, insects are not going to be the common, but... But the list that I found typically was flatworms, roundworms, annelids, your segmented worms, bivalves, echinoderms. Star, starfishes, etc. Yeah, sea stars and uh, urchins. Sorry. sea stars, etc. Sea star. it's my training. Uh, <laughs> the lancelet and is... The most common egg found in marine arthropods, though that's okay. a very big group, so they have exceptions. Right, right. So it's the you have your egg and your cell with your cell fluid, and the yolk is just stuff in there. Stuff in there. It's okay. it's mixed in. Usually, very low nutrients. Most of these have indirect development in that they have a larval state that hatches early. Right. So that's part of what you'll find with a lot of these different eggs is. If an animal hatches and is not fully developed, that is often associated with eggs that could not maintain a full development. Right. And then you have to do some do a lot more growing once you get out of it. Yes, the now you are little floaty crab. Go eat in the water. You have mesolecithal eggs, which are medium and have more yolk. You're seeing a pattern here? I am. These typically allow for longer fetal development, and often the yolk is isolated in a portion of the egg okay it has its own space it has its own space and they call the spaces of the egg the vegal pole which has the yolk and the animal pole which is where the cell would oh, where the animal is yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> and that's where you'll find most of like the cytoplasm and this is where it's in some groups you'll find full development they hatch as little versions of the adults like in hagfish and some snails have these kinds of eggs but in a lot of the others, they'll find larval development where they are hatching as a less developed or not yet adult form when they are born. And these are going to be things like lamprey and some salamanders Okay, have eggs like this as well. So you have a little yolk separate from the, the, the mm -hmm. cell that is going to make a baby. Yep. But you have a little packet of nutrition that sits next to you and kind of feeds you along the way. And, and then you're born as a larval salamander and you're not done yet. So you got to keep going. Yes, exactly. So for some animals, it may be enough. Others, not enough. And then you get to the macro lecithal, which is what you think of when you think of an egg. The eggs in the fridge. It's typically larger eggs, not always big, but comparatively with a lot of yolk. Plenty of food for full development. Right. Or for a larger predator to come along and yes. crack the egg open and eat the yolk. Yep. Because there's a ton of nutrition in there. Because <laughs> it is just food. It is pure goodness. Yep. <laughs> now, this is where I was most reminded of our eyes episode, because there are two groups that have this egg. Want to guess? Uh, oh, I, I'm going to guess. <laughs> One of them must be amniotes. Yep. Which are your reptiles, birds, mammals, ancestrally. Yeah. And in fact, most vertebrates have this egg, even the non-amnio ones. Okay. So like frogs. Yep. And so oh, okay. So vertebrates. Yeah. I'm gonna guess insects. Not insects. Oh, <gasps> go on. Cephalopods. Oh, eyes. Right. The yes, eyes comparison. Exactly. So squids and octopi, yes. octopuses, octopodes, have and cuttlefish. similar eggs to vertebrates. And go back to episode 68. Where there are only two groups to have created the camera eye vertebrates and cephalopods what's going on <laughs> it's, they, it's, someone's cheating off of somebody else it's a is what's conspiracy. happening if i i was a teacher for a while i know what's going on here <laughs> change it enough so that they can't tell so yeah th these are what you think of as the the common egg the typical egg what we usually see when you look up a picture of an egg and 
most of these groups, not all, but most of these groups are able to develop into fully functional, non-larval babies. Right. You got enough food in the egg. Yes, you can develop full term, as it would be said. But there is still a variation in how full term different eggs, especially in birds, this is noticed, which... Spoiler warning, we're going to talk about birds a lot. And their cousins. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a pattern noticed in birds that are precocial and altricial. Okay, so meaning ones that are born able to basically move around and take care of themselves yep. versus ones that need mom and or dad to care for them for a while. Exactly. So precocial are, if you think of like chickens, they hatch and they are chicks, cheep cheeping, running around. And then attritional is like robins, where they just sit there and they're ugly and they're pinky and yeah, they, they just scream with their mouths open. Yep, yeah, waiting for food to drop in. And when they, like, if you've ever watched one, like, try to move around, it's just all elbows. It's just, ugh. In those two eggs, typically with precocial eggs, there is more yolk. They have, the egg is about 40% yolk. And this is thought to be part of why they're able to develop and come out kicking. Right. They don't need to be fed for a while because they were fed plenty. Well, yeah, they were fed enough to be functional. Altricial often only have eggs that are about 25% yolk. Almost half the yolk, and they come out helpless. Wow, an egg that is 40% yolk. Yeah. So, like, almost as... It, it makes me think of, like, a space shuttle. Yes. Like... Most, a, a ton of your space is fuel. It's mostly fuel. <laughs> and as you use it up, it makes room for the baby. Yep. <laughs> Just like a spatial, as you use up more fuel, you need less fuel because you weigh less. Yep. <laughs> now, as far as the extra layers, the when we're getting into the surrounding of the embryo and the yolk, there are multiple membranes. We're going to be talking about membranes for the next little bit. Various <laughs> of various kinds. So you got to keep the baby separate from the world. Yeah, well, it's, when I was a little kid and I had a plate of food, I didn't like the food to touch. And in fact, I when I, like, earlier on, wanted to have a different utensil for each food, that's what eggs are like. They're like, no, 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 don't stop it. No, never the, never the, the two show me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you don't see the same number of membranes in every egg, and you see a different orientation of certain versions, basically, depending on the group you're in. Yeah, so when I think egg membrane, I'm thinking, like, the shell. Yeah. But I infer that there is a lot more to it than that. Underneath the shell, there are multi there are <laughs> many opportunities for membranes. <laughs> the first, the base membrane, is the vitiline membrane. And this is, in many groups, especially most of your invertebrates, the only membrane. Okay. It is... A skin that holds all of the cell stuff in, and then that's it. So a lot of your worms, a lot of your echinoderms, your cnidarians, a lot of those have just one little membraned sac that holds the egg. And I'm picturing something thin and transparent and kind of jelly-like. Like it's a water balloon with all the stuff of an egg inside. Just enough to keep everything together. Yes. As we'll see, this membrane is present in other groups, but now it is gathered by more. In most other groups, this is the membrane you see surrounding the yolk. Okay. And isolating the yolk. And while we're on invertebrates, there's also, we see a similar uh, uh, situation with eggs when it comes to the precocial and nutritional birds with larval stages in many marine arthropods. So your crustaceans and all of those, that there's basically two types of larva, a yolk fed a lecithotrophic larva which means they feed on the yolk and then when they hatch they don't feed they just are there until they develop out of being a larva because they were able to feed on the yolk or planktotrophic larva which don't have as much yolk and have to hatch as early as possible and start eating yeah eating plankton eating I, plankton I yeah. yeah you gotta go float around and eat stuff until you're ready to basically adult as soon as mouth parts are developed, they hatch. And because their eggs don't have enough yolk, they would die in the egg if they stayed in it longer. So you'll see this pattern in lots of eggs that there's this kind of gradient of the what kind of egg you have affects the way you develop and are born. 
but this is not an embryology episode, so we won't be delving into it with everyone. <laughs> but in short, it does mean that the type of egg you come out of strongly influences your life cycle and your behavior coming out of the egg, which is really interesting. Yes, it's it is they are they are intrinsically tied as to the way an animal begins life and the egg they developed in. Insect eggs do get a little more complex. They still have the vitelline membrane, but they also now do have a shell. So shells refer to a protective coating on the outside, typically more substantial coating on the outside. Not always hard, but an actual barrier to the outside world. The insect shell, called the chorion, which is a hard shell, but it's not made out of the same material as like chicken egg shells. It's their own version of a shell. Okay, something to keep them safe from mm-hmm. things around them. And indeed, insects are largely land-based. Yep. Which makes sense that you would need a protective shell on land. Yeah, you're exposed to the elements. It does have a couple of odd features compared to eggs we'll talk about in just a moment. So in most cases, the shell is one of the last things to go on an egg. Egg gets fertilized, and then you develop an egg and a shell around it and lay the egg. Right. Well, the chorion actually develops before the egg is fertilized. Hmm. So the chorion is notable for having multiple pores on it. Both, some of them are for oxygen coming in and out, and others are for sperm to get in. Interesting. So you make a protective casing as an insect before there's ever a little insect in there ready to become an insect. Yes, exactly. Huh. But one thing that this shell does entail, though, is internal fertilization which most insects internally fertilize you're not spraying the eggs and fertilizing them from the outside there is some interesting variety with the pores though because the oxygen pores the ones for letting air through are called aeropiles and for aquatic insects that lay their eggs underwater they don't have aeropiles makes sense just passively let oxygen move through the shell from the water so yeah fundamentally different structures depending on the environment they're in and speaking of eggs and water let's talk about some vertebrates and talk about fish fish have a variety of eggs because bony fish and cartilaginous fish have typically very different eggs cartilaginous fish have the classic egg case the mermaid's purse which is like this leathery covering so it's a shell in the fact that it's protecting the egg but it is not shell like at all for what you typically think of as an egg. Right, it's like a handbag. It is, and they are flexible, but tough, and a lot of them have structures on the outside for attaching the egg to stuff. Fibrous material to wrap around rocks, or barbs, you know, or shapes that allow them to be deposited. So it, it is a very unusual thing when we're used to eggs being typically uniform in shape. These have abstract shapes, Bony fish went the other way, where their eggs are very simplistic and really, really similar to amphibian eggs. I'm I'm picturing the scene in the beginning of Finding Nemo. Yes. With all just the little round uh, fish eggs. Yeah. Where, going back, they mainly only have one membrane, the vitelline membrane, but are covered with a gel layer. And so that's why you'll often hear them, like, hear that amphibians have jelly eggs Mm -hmm. and stuff. It's that gel layer. But other than that, it's one layer and then the inside is fairly normal egg stuff. Huh. One of the big things that limits these eggs is gas diffusion, is oxygen diffusion, because it is passive, like with those underwater insect eggs. It's just passing through the gel membrane into the egg instead of through a specific structure. And since, like, especially with amphibian eggs, they're often laid in big groups, this can further diminish the diffusion level, which is not like something that makes them bad eggs, but it is a limiting factor, which is good to note because the next type of egg are amniotes. Yeah, this when you talk about egg evolution, like, in my head, to, for my knowledge, there's Eggs and there's amniotic eggs. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Speaking as an amniote, I, I'm very biased. It's pretty good egg. Amniotes, as was mentioned earlier, are reptiles, birds, and mammals. Ancestrally, those are the amniotes. These are 
you, the Cadillacs of eggs. Once again, as the phrasing goes, I don't know if Cadillacs are still actually really good cars. Yeah, I have no idea. But these have multiple layers. This is a bit... You, Pat's egg. <laughs> you could fit so many layers in this, baby. <laughs> so many membranes. <laughs> these are complex. They have multiple parts, multiple layers, and shells. Yeah. When you think an egg, this is what you're picturing. Chicken egg, snake egg, egg, sh- egg with a shell, yes. opaque. Mm-hmm. Can't see inside of it, unlike if you look, look at frog and fish eggs, you can see the little embryo. Yeah, you can watch them develop. In there. These are your classic eggs, and the eggshell is one of the big differences. The eggshell of an amniote egg is typically a mineralized structure made out of calcium carbonate that is tough, varying thicknesses. Some of them are very, very thin. It's just a thin layer of hard eggshell, while in others it's thick layers, birds typically. But you have variety there still. While in others, it is actually this more soft, semi-rigid. Right, kind of leathery. Kind of leathery. It's almost like a like a soft plastic, you know? Yeah. It's a... They're flexible. They hold a shape, but they are, you know, so they're not goo, but they are able to move and give way. Right. As opposed to like a bird egg, which you drop it and it It shatters shatters because it's rigid and hard. Mm -hmm. Typically, you find the soft eggs in your squamates, lizards and snakes, Mm -hmm. and all the other groups have hard shelled eggs. Uh, Turtles have a mixture. Some have soft, some have semi-rigid some have slightly shelled because turtles refuse to play by anybody's rules they're so weird episode 60 but birds have hard shells crocs have hard shells and there are still the monotremes that lay eggs which mammals amniotes like that if you needed solid evidence (laughs) ancestrally we laid eggs even though all that's left today are platypus and echidna yep the monotremes but and we'll go into this in a bit more detail in just a moment, but even us mammals who have gotten rid of the egg still have the parts. We sure do. Inside. So let's go over the parts of an amniotic egg. The shell, though rigid and hard, is actually semi-permeable. It is covered in pores. and has as many as 17,000 tiny pores across wow. its surface. Because an egg needs to breathe. Yep, it's it, letting in air. It can't just be a completely closed off... Like, little little embryo needs air, too. Yep, it, it needs oxygen going in, CO2 going out, because that's how breathing works. That's how animals do it. And water vapor slowly leaves the egg. And as things are used up inside, because when you breathe out, water vapor is part of that. Now, the pores only make up about 0.02% of, like, a duck egg was the example given in that measurement. Hmm. So it's not like it's this wiffle ball. Right, you're not sticking a needle through Yeah, it. but... Lots of tiny holes all over. <laughs> but oxygen and water vapor molecules can fit through. Yes. <laughs> they, I don't know what you're talking about. And it's often covered in a extra coating on the outside called the bloom or cuticle, which is an antibacterial coating. Oh, that's cool. And this is why if you've ever like bought eggs from a farm, it's actually a little bit healthier because that gets washed off grocery store eggs. Oh, okay. Yeah. it's So washing the egg is... It is not actually a great idea because that's where the antibacterial barrier for the inside of the egg is. It's interesting to think, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but that the amniotic egg is hailed as this huge marker of the transition from waterlocked mm-hmm. to terrestrial land that an amphibian can't live, you know, in a place without water because their eggs are so vulnerable. All these different adaptations that have that showed up for like, yeah, no, actually thick outside eggs, antibacterial stuff, which yeah. maybe other eggs have, but what an interesting feature to have on an Oh, egg. yeah. The, these eggs are the Fort Knox for <laughs> an embryo. It's ridiculous. You still have the vitelline membrane, which is still enclosing the yolk. So that's... We still got it. You have the the albumin, or albumin. Albumin. Albumin, which is the white of the egg. That's okay. the... You know, the see-through part, if you crack an egg open and then it turns white when you cook it, that's why it's called the white of the egg. It's kind of like how lobsters aren't red until you boil them. <laughs> uh, it's, that's the major amount of cytoplasm in ooplasm, I think is the term, for the inside of the egg. So cell fluid. Cell fluid. 
And there's often an airspace in the egg, which acts as a temporary respiratory thing, but also a cushion for the embryo, for, you know, to, to cushion it from the outside world even more so. Wow, it, like bubble wrap. Yeah, and when it's, if you've ever hard-boiled egg, have you ever noticed how there's like a flat spot? It's the air bubble. Huh. <laughs> it's where it didn't have anything to boil. <laughs> but there are three membranes that are really the amniote membranes. These are the things that make it an amniote egg. And that is the amnion, duh, duh. the allantois, and the chorion. I thought chorion sounded familiar. Yeah, this is a major part of the amniote egg. It's just not the shell. Right, so a different function kind of yeah. than a similar structure that yeah. we see in the insects. Exactly. The amnion is a membrane that surrounds the embryo. Okay, so like how the vitelline layer in us is surrounding the yolk, mm -hmm. now the embryo has its own yep. surrounding layer? its own little uh, water balloon with amniotic fluid inside, Ooh. which you've probably recognized before. It's important for babies. This is to provide the embryo with a stable environment. So its main job is just to be just for the embryo, nothing else changing inside that bubble. The allantois is kind of this bubble that comes off of the hindgut. It's where it develops. That's for gas diffusion and waste removal. And it is going to get rid of the waste gases and collect fecal material and stuff. Huh. So it's like a little trash bag in the egg. Yeah, basically. And then the chorion, which surrounds all of those membranes, the vitelline, the amnion, and the allantois, and it provides... Overall enclosure, keeps those together, and during development, it fuses with the allantois and then becomes the, the chorio-allantoic membrane, which then eventually becomes in direct contact with the egg shell and is a big part in the gas diffusion. Gotcha. So uh, the amniotic egg is just all sorts of compartmentalized. It's super nothing touches. It's like a little mansion. Everything has its room. Yes. Exactly. This is the rec room. This is the good room. <laughs> this is the trash room. Yes. <laughs> this, this is the, the kitchen. The kids room. <laughs> and even with all that complexity, there's still a huge variety. Of course there is. And once again, especially in birds. Bird, oh. Birds have really done a number. They've taken the egg concept and they're like, this is our thing. <laughs> you all can do your simple versions. We're <laughs> going crazy with it. Just some of the varieties, size and shape, are hugely variable. Sizes, the smallest of bird eggs would be hummingbird eggs, which can be an ounce. <laughs> and the ostrich, which is the largest living, which is three and a half pounds. Whew. So many ounces. Many ounces. <laughs> many hummingbird eggs. It's like those wow, things of how many... <laughs> yes. How many Earths can you fit in the sun? Right, right. How many hummingbird eggs? How many hummingbirds can be born from an ostrich egg? Oh, man. 16 times three and a half is how many. <laughs> Some sort of number I can't even measure. But then you also find weird proportions where like, smaller birds tend to lay proportionally larger eggs than larger birds compared to their body size. Like... A wren, you know, fairly small bird, the weight lays an egg that is 13% its own weight, while in an ostrich, the egg's only 2% of its weight. That makes sense. An ostrich is very big. Yeah. But you end up, so that means that you end up having these small birds laying eggs that just look like they shouldn't have fit in there. <laughs> and we talked in episode 86 about kiwis. Oh my gosh, the biggest egg to body ratio of any bird. Yeah. Egg shape is where it gets a little weird because there's a lot of variety and we thought we knew why until a study a few years back that said, no, it's not why. At most eggs are egg-shaped, quoting the article. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some things that's just, it's the it, sort of spherical, yeah. but not quite spherical. Sort of it, shaped like an egg. Sort of shaped like an egg, <laughs> yeah. Most eggs are egg-shaped, but there are some that are not, like owl eggs are almost spherical. You get elongated eggs you get cone shaped where it's very narrow and very wide mm -hmm. on the opposite ends and with some of these especially the like cone shaped eggs they thought that it was due to nesting habits that cone shaped eggs could fit in with small points 
Right, like pizza slices. Like pizza slices. Could You could fit more eggs in a nest if more efficiently that way. There's also the idea for high nesting birds that a cone-shaped egg, if you're nesting on a cliff face, does not roll in a straight line. Right. It rolls in a circle. I've it, heard that. Mm-hmm. Like a, like a top. It's not actually going to roll straight off the cliff. And so you have a chance to save it. But a study in 2017, Mary Stoddard et al., took a look at egg shapes. They looked at 50,000 eggs from a, from 1,400 species. Wow. And they found little cor- correlation between nest type, nest location, or number of young and egg shape. Interesting. So I remember, actually, I remember hearing about yeah, the study. I remember when this came out because the answer is bizarre. The pattern they found was more correlated with flying types. Huh. Wing ratios, the ratio of wing length and width to find that strong flyers, fast flyers, like the examples are like sandpipers and murs tend to lay very elongated, narrow eggs, while less flighted birds, you know, I guess less powerful, less flighted. powerful or not flying as often tend to lay more spherical eggs. And the thought here is that if you're a strong, quick flyer, you have evolved a narrow, streamlined body yeah, that can't pass a ball. It has to pass a tube. Yeah, you are you have to be aerodynamic, and you, you, you have to balance both things. Yeah, you've narrowed spaces that beforehand may have been able to pass a more rounded egg. So it actually seems that flying is a more telling bit of info for egg shape than the way you're laying the egg that is which makes total sense that egg shape would be determined by the shape of the parent's body yeah well it's like the play-doh press things <laughs> yep. which bird do you put out the end and that's the shape that comes out <laughs> yeah and yeah it's seems counterintuitive until you think about the fact that you have to pass a rigid structure through your hips what shape are your hips <laughs> yep <laughs> before our break let's go over a little bit of the evolutionary history Brief, brief overview, because every single group has its own eggs, and they all would have their own evolutionary history. So if you want several episodes about eggs, let, you, us, let us know. <laughs> you know where to send those requests. <laughs> but as far as the history of eggs go, the earliest eggs, the earliest evidence for eggs, goes back to some fossils that are 600 million years old. And these are fossils from South China that were first described in 1998. By Shuhai Shao et al., or and colleagues, as it was described, where they found thousands of embryonic microfossils. Excellent preservation, 3D. So they were able to see the embryo. They were preserved in phosphate and were in the first stages of development. Some even seemed to be hatching, where there was this clockwise spiral grooves and like a knife slice in the shell, or in the outer membrane at least, with the embryos beginning to emerge. Cool. Now, here's where they ran into a problem that most fossil eggs have. What's the adult? Yeah, we talked in episode 33 about ontogeny. Mm -hmm. And we've mentioned this elsewhere, about how it can be difficult to tell a young animal Mm -hmm. and and an adult animal if they're the same species. Well, that issue is compounded a whole lot more when the young is an embryo (laughs) yep when not only are you an embryo but you might be an embryo of something that is going to hatch into a larva yeah and if i showed an alien a caterpillar and a butterfly right or i would win a bet if they (laughs) or a frog egg yes here tell me what this is going to turn into (laughs) (laughs) so they kind of had to sit with that mystery until a couple years later in 2000 the same team discovered a coral like animal so not a coral, but... No, this is Precambrian. Coral adjacent. That may be a, a potential candidate for parenthood. When they... This is like a really, really old episode of one of those reality TV yep. shows. Was it Maury? Yeah, yeah. You are you are not the father? Yes, exactly. This is this is the where everyone's on bated <laughs> breath as we do the, the uh, uh, DNA test. When they took another look at the specimens and removed the egg case... They were able to see that some of them were forming into a spiral organism and beginning to uncoil. And it seems like they might have been uncoiling into a tube-like structure similar to this coral-like animal. 
Okay. So perhaps the earliest eggs on record, not the first eggs. No. <laughs> most likely. But the earliest eggs we have a record of were a coral-ish animal. Cool. From the Ediacaran. Yes. Very, period. very old. Very, very old. Which makes sense, given that eggs are so widespread among animals, that, yeah, this is something that goes all the way back to the beginning. And generally speaking, the structure of eggs is very conserved. Eggs are fairly recognizable as eggs throughout animal history. There are parts that evolve quickly. Amino acids and proteins on the the outer surface of the egg actually have been shown to evolve very quickly. And people have hypothesized that it may be a key in speciation because the surface of an egg only recognizes certain sperm. And so this could be a barrier to hybridization or cross fertilization. Oh, that makes sense. In animals. And so there are the the egg's a weird structure in that it seems to be both evolving or very, you know, not necessarily evolving slowly, but very conserved in overall structure, while other parts of it are evolving very quickly and changing rapidly. And then, as you noted, the next big event in egg evolution is the amnio <laughs> egg. Once again, so say we. I'm sure that someone out there is going, insect egg evolution is so cool. Yep. Uh, the amniotic egg is seen as extremely important and valuable and revolutionary, which it is. Yes. Um, and has been given a ton of attention because that's what we are. And, and this is another big part that we'll go into after the break. It's also a major chunk of the fossils we have. Yep. Which and affects things. We talked about this in episode nine about the Cambrian explosion, that one of the best things that came out of the evolution of hard body parts, shells and bones, mm -hmm. is that they started showing up reliably in the fossil record. You don't get a lot of fossils of fish and frog eggs yep but boy do you get a lot of good bird eggs and dinosaur eggs and stuff so that the bias isn't just our fault <laughs> <laughs> the universe is biased towards us chemistry <laughs> shelled amniotic eggs as far as our evidence has evolved at least 325 million years ago soft shelled amniotic eggs very likely evolved before that don't have a great record so our earliest amniotic definite evidence goes back 325 million years ago. Carboniferous. Yes. Now, though we have a decent record of shelled eggs because of that lack of good soft shell fossils, we don't have a great understanding of the origin of amniotic eggs. It's, it's the kind of the bat scenario. The earliest fossils are amniotic eggs. Right. Well, it's like the earliest shelled organisms. We don't have a great fossil record of what came before mm -hmm. that because they weren't shelled, they were squishy. But we do have some cues as to how things, how some of the trends might have gone. Uh, one, which is kind of a gimme, is that something that probably had to predate amniotic eggs was internal fertilization. Okay, so when we say internal fertilization, we are meaning that one of the parents directs sperm into the body of the yep. other parent so that the egg inside the body becomes fertilized. Yes, because you have two modes of fertilizing eggs. Typically, you have oviparity, which is you lay eggs and then the male fertilizes them, usually in water. Right. So this is when you see fish, like the females will spray out the eggs and then the males will spray out the sperm. And Spawning. Meet in the water and fertilize. Yes. The water is the medium with which the sperm travels through to get to the egg. Sometimes it's I lay my eggs in a spot and then I fertilize on top of them. Other mm -hmm. animals, it's I shoot my eggs in the water, I shoot my sperm in the water, and I go about my day. And we all hope. Yep. <laughs> and then you have oviparity, which is what you, the typical term you hear, which is egg is inside the female. Mating happens. Right. Copulation. Copulation. The egg is fertilized inside the female and then the egg is laid externally. Right. So it all happens inside until it's fertilized and then you can build the shell and lay the egg. This internal fertilization most likely had to predate amniote eggs because unless we were doing something similar to insects where we were making penetrable shells, you need to fertilize it before you lay it with a hard shell. Because then when you spawn on it, it just gets on the shell. Yeah. I was also going to say, actually, now that I think about it, the hard shell of 
what we think of amniotic eggs is built by the parent. Mm -hmm. Like that comes from resources within the parent's body, not the egg itself developing a shell. Yes, exactly. So there are, there are steps that likely had to come before we were able to start laying shelled, you know, hard shelled eggs. And there are some typical advantages associated with this monumental step. You mentioned one of the big ones is a big thing attributed to the amniotic egg is that it allowed vertebrates to leave the water permanently. Yeah, you can lay that egg wherever you want. Because a frog egg will dry up. It is jelly, which is why amphibians return to moist or watery environments to lay their eggs. You know, there are there are weird exceptions where I keep my eggs in my belly and now I can leave the water. But it's still a moist environment. Right. You can't, like, dig a little hole in the dirt and lay your egg in there. You can't make a little patch of sand and stick mm -hmm. your egg on there. You can't make a dry twig nest. <laughs> yep. So this new encapsulated egg that kept water in and the environment out allowed us to move from the water and start exploring drier and drier environments yep. and dominate the land. There's also some other advantages associated with since amniotes are internally fertilized, that also means that you could be more selective with mate, you know, who you choose to breed with. And so there's a bit more control there. Lots of things that would have had a big effect on amniotes. But people have pointed out that the importance of the amniotic egg may have been overemphasized. Potentially. What? They point out... Uh us? Yes. <laughs> Overemphasizing something in our own evolutionary story? Preposterous. They point out that the whole idea of why the amniotic egg was so helpful is really hinged on the concept that the way amphibians lay eggs today is the same as the way ancestral amphibians laid eggs. Yeah, we discussed last episode, episode 91, mm -hmm. that modern amphibians most likely belong to a single branch of the amphibian family tree, which means that their traits, while interesting, might not necessarily be the traits. It's like looking at chameleons and assuming yes. that all lizards are like that. And that's the point they're making here is the frog or salamander egg is typically pointed at as, yeah, that's what ancestral amniote eggs would have looked like. But did they? Yeah, we, we don't, don't know because we don't have that fossil record. <laughs> so there are holes. Mysteries abound. Yeah, exactly. There are pores. We There are pores in our evidence of how, why amniotes are so great. There definitely could have been ancestral amphibians that were laying different kinds of eggs and doing just fine on dry land that just weren't fossilizing for some reason. So go find... Everyone go out and excavate in Devonian. <laughs> go find something you think is an egg and bring it to a museum. They'll no. love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they'll, they love when you do that. <laughs> so we've, we've been... They do love when you do that. If you find something cool, take yes. it to a museum. Let them identify. No, it. go do that. We are, we are being bitter. <laughs> We're poking fun at ourselves. <laughs> so we've been mentioning this fossil record of eggs. So now let's take a break, and after it, we will dive into what the fossil record of eggs is like. So the fossil record of eggs is strange for the fact that it is both really good and really bad, depending on what eggs you're looking at. Some eggs fossilize incredibly well because when your shell is mineralized already, you don't have much more mineralization you have to do. Yeah, you're half fossilized to begin with. Yes, we laid you surrounded by a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the other hand, the rest of eggs... The other 99 point whatever percent... <laughs> ...are not covered by minerals and therefore fossilize incredibly poorly. Not to say we don't have fossils of non-hard-shelled amniotic eggs, but they're rare, and therefore we don't have a lot of understanding about, like, their history, their origins, their evolution, how they changed. So we'll go through kind of some snapshots of egg fossil record and what it's been like. There have been some, like, notably weird egg fossils, because whenever you find an egg that's not a dinosaur 
and therefore bird egg. Yeah, dinosaurs include including but not limited to yes <laughs> birds. It's always kind of a standout of like really you did. And there have been some neat ones like tapeworm eggs. Yes, that were found in what is thought to be a shark coprolite, a fossil poo from 270 million years ago. Yeah, there are actually many examples of parasite mm-hmm. eggs found in poops. That one, I know because I wrote about it not too long ago, is the oldest evidence of a tapeworm infection. Yes. And so parasites are one of those cases where you sometimes get around the fact that they don't have strong eggs because their eggs are being passed in feces. So like you said, we made a fossil around (laughs) the egg. (laughs) Yep. The fossil was poop. So you do get... Episode 30. Yes. In this poop specifically, there were 93 small... Most likely tapeworm poop. It's like sections of tapeworm, and the basically way a tapeworm reproduces is by breaking sections of itself off that become tapeworm eggs. Yeah, tapeworms are weird. So, like, technically a tapeworm egg, but it's also part of a tapeworm. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We do have some eggs that, like, you really wouldn't expect, or I really didn't expect there to be a record of, ammonite eggs. Oh. We do have ammonite egg fossils. Interesting. Ammonites, the... Curly cued shelled cousins of today's octopus and squid. Yep. From episode 16. Yep. There are some fossils from Dorset, England that date back to the Upper Jurassic in the Kemmeridge clay formation. And they found eight clusters of small spherical and semi spherical objects that have been interpreted as ammonite eggs. They seem to fit the bill. And you'll hear that with a lot of eggs sometimes. Of have been interpreted as. Right. Because, once again, unless mom fossilized next to them while laying them. Yep. Or unless you have an embryo fossilized inside the egg. You don't. And even sometimes with the embryo, depending on if you have fossils of the adult or how good the embryo, like. Yeah. It's very rare that we get to match an egg to an adult for sure. Eggs are a form of trace fossil. Yes. And we have discussed before, it can be. Very difficult with trace fossils, be they footprints or otherwise, to know for sure who left the footprint or the egg or the poop. Yep. And they also do get their own ichnotaxa, just like other trace fossils. Yeah, a lot of eggs will be called OO, insert Mm -hmm. description of the egg or what animal we think it is. For instance, fossilized egg cases that may be elasmobranch or chimera, so sharkish, skatish eggs cool have been found going back to the devonian very cool and then egg sacs that are more confidently grouped with these animals have been found back in the carboniferous to oligocene okay so like so co- confident going back more than 300 yes. million years with- so we have there is records just very incomplete yeah we don't get them often we don't get them consistently so you do find things From different animals. I also remember there was a study. I don't remember if we mentioned this on the podcast, but there was a discovery not too long ago, uh, several years ago, of a trilobite specimen that had what was interpreted as eggs underneath its head. Yes, 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 yes. uh, Exoskeleton that appear to be the trilobite carrying around a bunch of its eggs, which I think we see in some animals today. Maybe horseshoe crabs or maybe something similar to that. Which is like... Trilobites are so cool. Trilobites are very cool. Episode 80. Trilobites are very cool. Episode 82. There are some egg fossils that are challenging for a reason I didn't think of until I read it and then it made sense. There are some egg fossils that may be fish or amphibian. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Weird. So. (laughs) (laughs) It's a real, it's a tough job. Yeah. So with most fossils that are attributed to one of those two groups, evidently it's. It, it is very difficult to try to determine. Hmm. So even when sometimes we get egg fossils, you may not even be able to get it to the right taxa, let alone like species. But as we get to amniotes, the record does get a bit better. Let's, let's dive headfirst into personal and preservational biases. Yes. Some of the, the, you know, outgroups, uh, crocodilians, we do have crocodilian eggs. Uh, the earliest are from the late Triassic, early Jurassic, uh, which is fairly early. Yeah, crocodilomorph even. Yeah. 
And these were would have been rigid shelled. They would have had a tough eggshell. Right. Sturdy. Sturdy. And these fossils are some of the first rigid eggs in the fossil record. Cool. Uh, so like some of the earliest ones, though, once again, probably goes back decently before that. But we are able to learn some things from later crocodilian eggs, ones in the Cretaceous, that show that crocodilian eggs have basically been crocodilian eggs since that time. I thought it makes sense to me that eggs are fairly conserved, mm-hmm. which which is to say they don't change fundamentally yeah, wildly. Because uh, if it if it ain't broke, I mean, look, there there are certain things that it's cool to mess around with. But yes, sometimes you have to break a few eggs. Hey, uh, <laughs> but but like, listen, you evolution mess with like hands all oh, you yeah. want you can do whatever you want you, with my toes keep that egg <laughs> make sure that egg is is functional yes and we do have some turtle eggs once again about to the same age middle jurassic is the oldest known semi-rigid turtle eggs and then we see fully rigid later in the jurassic so like kind of around the same time and before we get to like what the rest of the conversations going to be about <laughs> there is the thing we mentioned in a news but i had to mention here yep, very recently yep this is the giant football sized fossil that has been interpreted as a giant soft-shelled egg yeah like a, a partially collapsed mm-hmm. soft-shelled egg which is would be the largest ever found 68 million years old and we don't know what laid it right it possibly a big squaw mate <laughs> which which means mosasaur. Yep. S- but uncertain. Go back to whatever episode that was yeah. and listen to our discussion. <laughs> and then th- th- the rest of the egg fossil record is dinosaurs. Yeah. I we I should mention, and I probably mentioned it in episode 79, there are pterosaur eggs. There are. There are. There are not very many. And in fact, I, I read a, re- a reference from not very long ago that base that was saying hey we haven't found any pterosaur eggs and then in the last like decade there have been a handful of cool discoveries so there are flying reptile pterosaur eggs but then also dinosaurs dinosaurs make up the bulk of the the egg fossils you'll typically hear about and see and that are commonly found birds included birds included because as far as we can tell all dinosaurs laid eggs our current understanding at least and a bunch of them laid thickly shelled calcium based eggs you said it in the very beginning of the episode when we were talking about that micro raptor news mm-hmm. we have said it before most of what we think of as bird things are actually dinosaur things yep that birds inherited and hard shelled eggs and indeed a lot of like nesting behaviors and stuff are on that list yes so the, the first dinosaur egg ever discovered was in 1923 Ooh. during an expedition by the American Museum of Natural History. To Mongolia? To Central Asia, Mongolia, yeah. exactly. And they found a nest, a set of el- elongated elliptical eggs. Yeah, o- oval. Ovalish, shit. yeah. And in the like first accounting, the first journal entries, basically what was written is their eggs. Like, we, we have found eggs. They are definitely eggs. There's even one quote that was, we continue to criticize the s- supposition from every possible standpoint, but finally we had to admit that eggs are eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that we could oh, make them goodness. out to be nothing else. That's fantastic. Like, they found them and they went, it, hey guys, it <laughs> we found eggs. It walks like an egg. It yeah. talks like an egg. <laughs> And just imagine what it was like, like the first time, because now it's like, duh, fossil yeah. eggs, whatever. But it's like we were, we've talked about when you find the first of a thing and everyone's like, hang on. Yes. Is that really what you found? Yeah. Eggs. And the, not only was this like, oh my gosh, fossil eggs, but okay. Yeah. So dinosaurs laid eggs. Yeah. We can check that off. <laughs> we assumed they probably did because, you know, reptiles and all, but yep. Presumed. Protoceratops. Right. The small-ish ceratopsian that we talked about a mm-hmm. bunch in episode 87. Exactly. Because those were the most common dinosaur in that area from that age. Uh, presumed. We'll go over that a little bit, just a, <laughs> little, a little bit more. Most dinosaur eggs are known from the, the middle Jurassic to late Cretaceous. Okay. So only about from 170 to 66 million years ago. Right. The latter half. The latter half. 
which is notable because dinosaurs were around the whole time of the age of dinosaurs and amniotes had been around way longer than that. So where are the rest of the eggs? And that's where we get into that preservation bias. And the question came up, okay, but yes, soft shelled eggs, but why not more dinosaur eggs? Because even not all groups are equally represented. Ceratopsian eggs are not known from the fossil record because those protoceratops eggs were not. No, theropod eggs tend to fossilize mm -hmm. rather abundantly. So your meat eaters, including your birds. Yep, theropods, sauropod eggs mm -hmm. fossilize fairly well. Other groups, not so much. So what's going on? We talked about this in a very recent news as well. Yep. There was a study that found evidence suggesting that early dinosaurs and potentially even some later groups very likely laid soft-shelled eggs. Yeah, they might not have had hard bird-like eggs the whole time. Now, we did not find soft egg shells preserved, but what we found was a clutch of protoceratops embryos that when chemically analyzed had evidence, had residue of what could be a soft shell around them. So the shell rotted away, but the embryo preserved. And this is an interesting thing about egg fossils, and you might mention this as we go on, but a lot of the time when you're studying egg fossils, you can get chemical analyses mm -hmm. these days. You can study those layers yep. that we keep talking about. You can and get a lot of detail. Yes, you can, and you can start getting into how it was built, and that can tell you about the parent and what experiences they were having. If this evidence for soft shell, for dino soft shells is accurate, it lines up with phylogenetic analyses that indicate thicker hard shells in sauropods and theropods and your ornithischians actually evolved independently in those groups. So hard shells were not a all dinosaur thing. Mm -hmm. Each group came to it on their own and probably didn't happen until the middle Jurassic where it advanced thick, you know, thickening, thickening of the shells. So it was something that was not late game, mid game yeah. for dinosaurs. Also around the same time that birds are showing up. Mm -hmm. This potentially could, it, might, it correlates with, could be a response to higher rates of oxygen in the atmosphere. Hmm. Now we can put a thicker covering on our eggs because they can breathe more easily. Interesting. Now that the air's more breathable for them. So that there may be, that may be why we see eggs shift or part of why we see eggs shift. Hmm. Yeah. Once again, though, we don't know. Right. This is a, a study from like a couple months ago. Yes. So th there's more discussion to be had. And, and even with the, us being able to say early dinosaurs may have had soft shelled eggs. We don't know. May have right. is as bad as much as we can do. Until next month when somebody <laughs> finds a platyosaurus egg and we go, oh, all right, I guess not. Yeah. Well, and also, like, even if we can say that. That may be all we get, ever get to say because we still don't have those eggs. Yep. <laughs> so, well, what were they like? How big were they? I said, as big as the baby. I guess. <laughs> baby plus yolk. But even with all those holes in our knowledge, eggs can tell us a lot. Yeah, they can. About fossil organisms. It is. Reading studies of fossil eggs is fascinating because like we were discussing earlier, what an egg is like can tell you a lot about the parent. It can tell you a lot about the lifestyle of the baby. And that is true for fossils. Yeah. Now, this this research is not research on the eggs, but I felt it was good to mention because it has to do with how long the babies were in the eggs. I was hoping you were going to yeah. mention this one. Development is a big question whenever we find fossil eggs. How long would these be eggs or have they been eggs? And when it comes to dinosaurs, because once again, they're the best record we have, so that's where most of the research is. It varied. Uh, birds are our, you know, typical measurement. And birds are actually unusual uh, compared to other egg layers. Birds have relatively small numbers of eggs that are relatively large for their size compared to the animal with relatively short incubation periods. Yeah, they hatch pretty quick. 11 to 85 days is the typical range. And that's compared to, like, your typical reptiles, which are more upwards of like a hundred or so days, you birds have fairly quick incubation periods. So they're often what dinosaurs are compared to because they are dinosaurs. And dinosaurs seem to fall out in a range of different time lengths from the bird. When theropods were looked at using 
histology of embryonic teeth, so cutting thin layers and then counting the ring, the growth rings of baby teeth. Right, how much have these teeth grown? Mm-hmm. They were able to find that on the babies they looked at, which were troodons, troodontids. Yeah, small theropods. They were 39 days old in these specific specimens. And comparing them to crocodilians and when they develop teeth, which you can't do with birds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they don't have those. Episode 88. Yes. <laughs> crocodilians that start developing their functional dentition, their functional teeth, 47% of the way through their incubation, which would mean an incubation period of about 74 days. Which is very bird-like. Which is, which is fairly bird-like. It falls out in between the averages of bird and the other reptiles. Yeah. So it, it's faster than crocs and turtles and lizards, but slower than most birds. Yeah. So you, you have that one that seems to be kind of moderate, I guess. Now, the issue with these kinds of studies is you can't always tell how exactly close was the embryo to hatching. These were ones interpreted as being very close right. to fully developed, but there's always going to be a range of error, and you're typically going to underestimate, you know, because... Were they three days, four days, five days, ten days? Mm-hmm. You're typically going to lose a little bit of that. And then what, when along their developmental cycle, they start developing exactly. teeth. So we, we're taking a best stab at it. It's not exact, but it, it gets us a ballpark. A similar study was done with ornithischian dinosaurs from various taxa and various sizes. And their histology showed that they had very slow incubation periods of 2.8 to 5.8 months. So way longer. Yeah, so more in the 100 to 150 or yeah. so days. So in the more typical reptile range right, right. than anywhere near your typical bird range. Which makes sense because theropod, the, the troodontids mm-hmm. are quite close to birds. And then when some sauropodomorphs, Lufangosaurus, which is from China, they found 20 embryos from this dinosaur. That were preserved at different stages of development. Uh, it seems they were, the eggs were flooded, and then the embryo bones gathered as gotcha. the water moved. So they have the bones of various embryos. They don't have the eggs, and they couldn't get an incubation time from them. But they could say that it seemed like they developed very quickly, hmm. unusually quickly, and may have then continued to grow quickly afterward. Interesting. So you have different. Yeah. Modes. One dinosaur egg would not have been an egg for the same amount of time compared to others. Which is interesting because that tells you how much the egg had to endure. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about parental care in Mm -hmm. dinosaurs. And there are studies of dinosaur eggs that help us understand parental habits. Absolutely there is. And the difference between an egg that hatches in two months versus an egg that hatches in five months, <laughs> that is that is different for the parents. Yes. And so pr- parenting is a big bit of info we get from studying fossil eggs. Sometimes by the way they're laid, there's the famous Myasaura, the mother dinosaur, the mother lizard. But there's also some fun stories. My favorite story is those famous protoceratops eggs that we used to think were protoceratops eggs. The ones from 1923. But this was a different clutch of same kind of eggs, so presumed to be protoceratops again, with a theropod skeleton crouched menacingly atop them. Yep. Of an oviraptor. Of of what was called oviraptor because of this association. Ovi, egg, raptor, thief. Or plunderer. Yes. So this was thought to be an egg predator stealing from the nest of these well-known protoceratops eggs. Yeah. Yeah, everyone knows. Of course. And that was the case for forever. (laughs) (laughs) Until we actually got a look inside one of the eggs and were able to scan and see an embryo and see that it is actually an oviraptor. Yeah. And And since then, we have found a number of oviraptorids. Mm -hmm. So city... I don't know that oviraptor... And I think, if I remember correctly, the specimen that is based on might not actually be oviraptor yeah anymore but <laughs> but there are some of that kind of dinosaur that have been found fossilized sitting atop their nests yeah. brooding brooding like chickens now and, and most birds today exactly whether they are doing that for the similar reason as many birds to warm the eggs 
that we can't yeah, say for know. sure, or whether it's for protection, both are viable. Both are reasons that birds sit atop their eggs today. Which one it is, or is it both of them? Eh? But the parents were taking care, you know, monitoring and looking after the eggs after they were laid. We all There's evidence of dinosaur nesting sites, like you mentioned, Myasaura, mm -hmm. where you have multiple adults with associated with multiple nests where you are clearly sticking around in the area sometimes adults eggs and babies all in the same place yep suggesting that yeah mommy mom is hanging around for the babies to come out and so there's lots of potential behavioral information from the way we find eggs preserved and how they were laid or if they were being protected if you know was it in groups was it alone some dinosaurs seem to have buried their eggs in mounds yeah, like, like crocs a, yeah, like, like a croc others seem to have made open air nests and these can tell us a lot about how these animals were living and how they were starting life one part that is a cool thing we've been able to find out about eggs but also can add to some of this information is color yeah we have fairly recently, been able to identify color in dinosaur eggs. Which is important because before that, experts assumed that colored eggs were a very derived trait evolved more recently in birds. Yeah, because we see that in birds. <laughs> yeah, birds have tons of colored eggs, all sorts of colored and textured. Some of them are like chalky and bumpy and yeah. others are smooth. Some of them are oily and gross. But if you look at, you know, snake, turtle, lizard, croc eggs, they tend to be pretty bland. White. White. Spotted, maybe. But as we've said multiple times in this episode and in the podcast, bird traits equal dinosaur traits. <laughs> <laughs> and dinosaur eggs were indeed colored. They were able to confirm this. Uh, some of the first research on this was back in 2018, so recent. Very recent. With Raman microspectroscopy, which fires lasers and identifies chemical makeup of the thing you're firing lasers at. So it's a non-destructive way, which is really right. the reason this research has been able to be so widely applied. Even though it's firing lasers. Even though it's firing lasers. Not like death lasers. No, these are like stormtrooper lasers. They don't... <laughs> <laughs> they don't actually do anything. They don't do anything damaging. <laughs> and what they're looking for is whether they carry two pigment traces. The pigments being for blue-green and red-brown coloration. And... If you find traces of those pigments, there was some amount of color in that egg. So they've fired it at a whole bunch of fragments of a whole bunch of eggs, and they found some cool stuff. Very cool. Also, I just want to take a quick, just a quick moment. You said fragments of eggs, which is another really important thing yes. that I've been sitting on. Like, another benefit of having hard-shelled eggs is you can find parts of an egg. Yes, exactly. We found parts of eggshell at the gray fossil site from birds yeah because even yeah, a they, they break like that tough egg is still fragile and so it can still break but if you don't tear them into shreds and dissolve and you have shards you can keep those around yeah so they fired lasers at a bunch of dinosaur eggs and they found for some of the ones they looked at some troodontids had blue green beige or white eggs cool a couple of the the oviraptorsaur from the original study hyuania had Deep blue green eggs, as did Deinonychus. Oh, cool. Best dinosaur. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. Blue green <laughs> eggs. Interesting. Deinonychus also, and some troodontids, revealed darker speckling on top of that blue green background. So they may have been spotted. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. There you go. Why would you have colored eggs? Why is a good question. And is it the same origin with birds is another question really waiting to be answered i don't right. have the answers for you the, the three types of dinosaurs you just listed are all very closely yeah. related to birds yes they are so it could be that this is an ancestral trait and this research at least seems to support that which would mean that these pigments in eggs to provide color could go back more than 150 million years into their evolutionary line cool which is cool yeah now why are they colored most likely camouflage is the typical first answer. Right. Uh, for me, the first answer is that you found color on the eggs, which tells me they probably weren't buried. Yes. And that's a big part is when we were assuming that early eggs were probably white because everything but birds eggs are typically white. Yeah. But a lot of those like crocs and turtles bury their eggs. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what color they are. If you're looking at the eggs, it's already bad. 
Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You've already failed. Yeah. Everything is already bad. You shouldn't see the eggs at all. Uh, so they probably were exposed eggs. Yeah. Open nests. So camouflage could be part of it. Or egg identification. Yeah. To avoid parasitic egg laying from cuckoo-esque oh, animals. So like if another dinosaur wants to come over and hide one of its eggs in your nest... And you come back and you go, my eggs aren't red. Dinosaur or crocodilomorph. <gasps> there was a crocodilomorph egg found in the late Jurassic. And it's, I think, the oldest crocodilomorph egg, if I was reading things right, that was found alongside theropod, predatory dinosaur eggs. The nest contained around 20 eggs total and mixed in were some crocodilomorph eggs some hitchhikers that may have been a crocodilomorph trying to pawn some of its babies off on this protective mama theropod huh and then scuttle away and not have to worry about them interesting yeah now uh, lots uh, of conjecture yeah, yeah maybe maybe that, that would be cool <laughs> but if that is what was happening there having colored eggs could help avoid that kind of parasitism another tidbit that this potentially reveals is if coloration is ancestral in the bird evolutionary line it means that birds today with white eggs ostriches and parrots and like chickens lost it yeah re-evolved re-evolved white eggs uh, well presumably re-evolved yes if exactly that's, yeah <laughs> but that they that is a secondary trait not the ancestral or directly ancestral trait that's cool right yeah so there's lots of things we can find out from eggs the last thing i had to mention is an example of range extension in a roundabout way because it also gave me an excuse to talk about baby Louie. Yep. Which is a, probably one of the biggest, like, recent big dinosaur egg newses that came out. A little over 20 years ago, a nest was found from China that dated back 90 million years ago, and an embryo in one of those eggs was identified as baby Louie. Uh, fairly large eggs. They were about... 40 centimeters, so 16 inches long, Whew. and weighed 5 kilograms, or 11 pounds, and are some of the largest dinosaur eggs, period. But no adult identification. Right. We weren't able to co confirm what it was. Due to legal issues, because of it being taken out of the country it was in, research was kind of halted for a while. And so it took them a while to finally identify, and this is why it's recent news <laughs> instead of 20 years ago news, that it was a gigantic oviraptorosaur. Yeah. And now, Baby Louie could actually get a species name. Baby Long Sinensis, Baby Dragon from China. Yep. Baby Long means, in from Chinese, Baby Dragon. Yep. And yeah. Sinensis is the same genus name as the Chinese alligator. Yep. From yeah. China. China. Sinensis. So, based on the size of the eggs and the embryo, they suspect that the adult Baby Long would have been similar sizes to the famous Gigantoraptor, mm -hmm. which means about 26 feet long, 8 meters, and weighing a couple of tons. Huge, huge animals. Which but, is also funny because it means that someday, potentially, we will discover the adults of this species, and they will be these, like, two or three ton giant monsters whose name means baby, baby dragon. dragon. Well, because real dragons. The <laughs> That's big, true. This like, is a fair point. Yeah. Real dragons are gargantuan. Yes. <laughs> we we all saw Game of Thrones. That thing's huge at best. And another cool thing about these eggs is now that we have a species to go with them, similar eggs have been found in other places in Asia and North America, which means that if not the same species, similar giant oviraptorosaurs likely range through there that we just haven't found yet. Yeah, we don't have those fossils yet. So identifying the egg gave us a new culprit, a new giant predator to look for in other places. Yeah, or perhaps not a predator. The oviraptorids are the Ooh, ones very with good. beaks yeah. and stuff. So, oh, that would be cool. Yeah, so this is this this is more like a therizinosaur. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy either way. Whatever you ate. Now, before we wrap up the episode, there's one last thing to mention having to do with eggs, and it is those animals that have gotten rid of them. Right. So the other half of the egg story is when some groups decide to stop laying eggs and start giving live birth. And this is an odd phenomena for how common it is. Yeah, this has happened a lot. So 
we mentioned a couple of terms earlier on, oviparity and oviparity, egg laying. The other side of that is typically is viviparity, which is live birth. Live birth. You'll often hear the term ovoviparity, but that's kind of an outdated term nowadays. What that's typically referred to now is lesithotrophic viviparity, which is the embryo develops inside the female the same way it would in the egg, feeding off of like the yolk and stuff, and then is born live when it's developed. Right. The important thing here is it's not given any nutrition from the mother. Right. So if you think about mammals, uh, for example, we have a placenta. Yep. Which is a organ that is here direct transfer from the parent to the embryo. Whereas in an egg, it's here is your yolk. This is just for you. Yep. This is your yolk. There are many like it, but this one is yours. <laughs> Our version of the parody is matrotrophic. Viviparity, which means provided nutrients from the mother. Right. There are different versions of this. Some cases, uh, histrotrophic, the young is provided either infertile eggs or feeds on its siblings, mm -hmm. the other embryos in the womb. Yep. Uh, that's called intrauterine cannibalism, which yeah. is mostly only known from sand tiger sharks. But evidently, there's some evidence for it in like the black salamander. Oh, interesting. Which I didn't know about until I read that. I mean, it makes sense that there's just a almost full animal right there. It's basically the mother fertilizes a litter, but only the most developed or strongest of those embryos survives because they eat the other ones. Right. There can be only one. Sand tiger sharks have a bifolded womb, so there's only ever two. <laughs> so they the final two can't eat each other. Right. And they give birth to it's more like than one. Tournament bracket style. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> you're walled off. And then you have oophagy, which is the mother continually provides uh, eggs, infertile eggs to the young. Hemotrophic is what we do, where there is a actual line from mother to young providing nutrients from the mother's biology. Right. Like the parent and the, the embryo are connected. Connected. The umbilical cord is the classic example in placental mammals. Us and most mammals except marsupials and monotremes. But the placenta is actually very cool because it's just a modified egg. The parts of the placenta are the parts of an amniotic egg reshaped and redefined. The embryo is still surrounded by the amnion with its amniotic fluid. And the reason you hear about that so often is that's what doctors will check to test the health of the embryo because it's the fluid associated with the baby. The allantois and the yolk sac become part of the umbilical cord. Okay. And provide that connection where food can get to the embryo. And then other parts of them and the chorion make up the placenta. So we've just re reformatted the egg. Yes, exactly. Into not an egg. And the chorion's still there. It is fluid filled and that's what breaks before labor begins. Uh, when you're the, water the water yes, that breaks. The chorion breaking. Hmm. So it's still an egg it's just now integrated with the biology of the mother and it's still doing all the same things and this transition from egg laying to live birth has happened a bunch with similar results yes uh, when we were at dragon con last uh, we sat next to dr jessica hebert who informed us that placentas have evolved in multiple different groups of animals absolutely they have one of the oldest examples in fact the oldest is a placoderm we mentioned back in the placoderm episode. Episode 29. The armored fish, Matropices attenboroughi, which is a 380 million year old fossil of a female placoderm fish with an embryo inside connected by an umbilical cord. Very cool stuff. So like the most advanced, you know, biased mammal stock, speak of live birth came around almost 400 million years ago. No. So, yeah, this is not something unique to one group. Mammals didn't then invent live birth. It's come around many a time. In fact, a more than 150 different vertebrate groups have evolved live birth, which breaks down to once in mammals, once in placoderms, as far as we know, six times in extinct reptiles, mm -hmm. you know, including things like ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, as far as we can tell, Eight times in amphibians. Yeah. 
nine times in Chondrichthian, so sharks, there's plenty of sharks that give live birth and rays. 13 times in bony fish. Way to go, bony fish. And 115 times in squamates. Because lizards and snakes, <laughs> man, champions. Extant, extant squamates. Just living, <laughs> just living lizards and snakes. A hundred, what? 115? 15. 115 times, because man, lizards and snakes like to do it. Yeah, and these are all individual moments. Unrelated live birth moments in evolutionary history of vertebrates. So, how and why? <laughs> how does an animal transfer from laying an egg to laying a baby? Uh, which I know is not the best way to describe <laughs> giving birth, but that's what we're calling it. Uh, there is not a solid, like, step-by-step -step because it happens differently. Right. And it's happened multiple times. But there are a few things that are semi-necessary or most likely, we, you know, we think necessary to transition to live birth. One of which is something kind of weird. The parents, before they can start giving live birth, probably have to be able to determine the sex of that young genetically instead of by temperature like many reptiles do it. Because for many reptiles, turtles and crocs are the two big famous ones. The temperature you know, in the nest, the varying temperatures from top to bottom in the nest, determine whether those young develop as male or female. But if you're having a baby in the body, then it's going to be the same temperature all the time. Yep. So they don't use X and Y chromosomes or some version of that to determine sex. We mammals and live bearing animals do use genetics to determine male, female. So that way you're not having to worry about that temperature issue. And then the other part of it's actually fairly simple. The female just keeps retaining the egg for longer and longer until it hatches inside. <laughs> yeah, that seems to make sense. And then all the other more complicated versions stem off from there. But the big question for a lot of people is the whys. If eggs are so great, they you know you have this thing that you can deposit a young, it protects them from the environment, the mother no longer has to carry them while they're developing, and you can guard them in a nest, why would you move away from that system? And there are a few advantages to live birth that may have been the evol evolutionary push to start doing away with the shell. The big ones being that now you can protect the embryo directly inside the mother's body. Yeah, that seems like the biggest, most obvious yes. one. Yes, because as great as the eggs are at protecting from like bacteria and stuff, they're still exposed to the elements and predators and physics. And in the mother's body, now... You have to get through her to get to the embryo. Right. As long as mom's safe, which is one of mom's prerogatives anyway. Yep. <laughs> she was doing that before she was pregnant. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so you have that extra layer of protection. It also is a solution away from the temperature issues. True. Yeah. You know, if, if you're reliant upon temperatures and the world's temperature changes for some reason, those animals could be in trouble. Yeah. Live birth bearing animals, less so. But there are downsides to it as well. Because though the mom can now protect the embryo, the embryo is now putting the mom at risk. Yes. She is now burdened by a developing embryo, and her biology is having to cope with a organism growing inside her. Yeah, that's a lot of stress and strain yeah. on the body of the mother. Her nutrients is getting diverted away from keeping herself alive, and as uh, is common in humans with like second, you know, children after the first, the body can react poorly. To the embryo potentially so there are risks there are benefits and so there's not like a single answer for why it's probably depending on the case by case many cases as it turns out with live birth some animals it is beneficial though there are some who kind of keep a foot in both camps i think we talked about this news yep this is when the when, when i had those numbers yep before was uh, the lizard study that was very very recent the three-toed skink that yep, from australia had a litter of babies in three eggs in one live birth yeah so it can uh, a not just a species that can do both which that species already is known yep. to do but an individual that can give birth to f viable eggs mm -hmm. And held on to one of them and gave live birth to it later. And we, we see with these lizards and with others that the altitude is often a, a definer or a, a mm -hmm. 
indication because of the temperature and environmental difference it's sometimes it's better to lay eggs in warmer areas better to retain them in colder areas so it's just it's not that it's actually that big a deal evidently to yeah. switch from eggs to live birth i love when we learn that right i love when we have the uh, we we see a transition and we're like eggs versus live birth what a what an amazing transition and then we find an animal today that no we, i we can do both yep and but then there are some people who have questions for like, why haven't we seen it in certain groups? Right. You know, we've seen it in so many, just the big list I listed, but like birds. Yeah. Dinosaurs in general. Yes. As far as we know. We've not seen evidence for live birth. In fact, archosaurs in general, unless there are those marine crocs. I think marine crocs are thought okay. to potentially have given live birth, but I don't know how solid that is. All right. Uh, so yeah, this group of animals seems to rarely, if ever, yeah, transition to live birth. Uh, the old thought was that flight was the hinder, that carrying a baby was too much for right, flying. For birds. Yeah. But, but most people will go, yeah, but bats. Yeah, bats. Bats give live birth. Bats, but, so what a lot of people think is that it's just, there would be more disadvantages to advantages to carrying an egg, carrying an embryo when you are a powered flyer, especially because it would limit, you couldn't lay a clutch of eggs mm -hmm. like birds do you know bats as far as i'm aware typically only have one i'm pretty sure it's one baby at a time typically one baby I, to a mom i believe so as far as i've ever heard so there just may be enough restrictions that it's just not been worth it and they've been doing fine so why complicate it it could also be uh, just a physiological thing mm -hmm. like we were saying with the egg shape of eggs. yeah there could be that there's something about archosaurs about their bodies, about their physiology that just doesn't lend itself very well to giving live birth. Yeah, or potentially behavior. They pointed out that something in birds that you don't see in live-bearing uh, parents, the males in many species help brood the nest. Hmm. You'd lose that help yeah. if the mother was the only one carrying the embryo. You can, cert you can pull double duty with two parents on eggs. Yeah, yeah. Mom's the only one who's pregnant. This is fair. Now, but to counterpoint, yeah. uh, a lot of mammals, the males will help protect the female. Yes. And then the babies once they're born. So yeah, it it's an interesting... It's 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 this, that seesaw. It's that, yeah. that balanced scale. <laughs> it just depends on what your situation entails. And probably there have been a bajillion different answers, given how diverse eggs and egg layers and live bearers are. Absolutely. And with that, eggs, we're going to wrap up our egg talk. Cause if we go past this, now we're just talking about embryology and viviparity. And if you want those episodes, which are their own episodes, let us know. <laughs> this episode was packed with stuff. Oh my God. There is so just much membranes all the way down. I had to, so many membranes. I had to leave out people. Not really that many, <laughs> membranes, but so much cool egg stuff. I'm sh if there's something I didn't mention that we didn't discuss, please let us know. We'd be happy to add it to our list and come back because there's lots of things that while I was researching that I was like, oh, I want to go more into that, but yeah, we'll do more. Nope. If, if the people demand it. So the last thing for us to do this episode is patron question. Hey, one of the things that our patrons at a certain level can do is ask us questions that we will then uh, answer live kind of here on the podcast. We have one today. Yes, we do. Would you like to read it? I sure would. This one is a detailed biology question from mm -hmm. Michael, who asks uh, about a hypothetical situation. Uh, uh, Michael describes this idea that could, could you have a situation where you have a species where they exist across a continent where you have... Population A is next to population B is next to population C, mm -hmm. and the adjacent populations can breed with each other. But the populations on the on the ends, sort of, if you imagine the east and west end yeah. of this line, for example, are not breeding. Could you have the two ends develop into something dramatically different, possibly even new species, while still exchanging genetic information? through this chain of populations. Yeah, you have A to B, B to C, C to D, 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 D. But then A and Z now are at the opposite ends, not breeding. Could that be enough for them to become distinct? Yeah. And 
the answer is yeah that like yes question mark yes question mark <laughs> what you're describing is called a ring species yes it's, that's sort of you've described the straight version of a ring yes. species and so <laughs> the concept of a ring species is that if you have a population with some sort of barrier in the middle of their range right. you know, mountains, mountains or a, a, there's there's been examples cited around the pole yep the north pole and this population's circulating around this barrier and therefore the populations next to each other as either they spread out can interbreed but when you come all the way back around they've drifted genetically enough that the ring can't actually cycle and you now have two ends right you imagine like a horseshoe shape where the horseshoe is made up of populations that can breed with each other but then the end of the horseshoe is two populations next to each other that mm -hmm. don't actually connect because they are geographically distant, yeah, <laughs> related through the rest of the horseshoe. Now, your description would be a straight line, which is the same concept, right? Can this happen across a continent yeah. instead of around a thing? An example, like if you look up ring species on Wikipedia, there's a graphic that's like, yeah, straight line. It shows that as a concept. Uh, the reason it's typically talked about as a ring is because then you can confirm that those two populations don't interbreed. Right. If you had a line like Michael's describing, it would be very difficult to confirm that A and Z can't breed with each other. Other than artificially introducing them and things breed in artificial situations that shouldn't all the time. Right. Then it gets weird. That's <laughs> how you get ligers and all sorts of weird stuff like that. <laughs> So there are some examples. The classic one around the pole is the Laris gulls, mm -hmm. which go around the North Pole and have various subspecies throughout. And at each end, the herring and lesser black-backed gulls cannot breed. Mm -hmm. But basically every example you can look up for ring species has a big old, you know, in parentheses, but yeah. with the research. Some other research on these gulls showed that the, the overall group may not be from one lineage, that it may actually be from two separate right. lineages of gulls. So they already were separated. They did not speciate around the pole. They weren't the same group to begin with. Yeah. And so... And I think there's a, and there's the example of the salamanders yeah. in California. Encetina. The Encetina, yep. Right? Where, if I remember correctly, because they're around the mountains. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the arguments have been either or that the ends actually do show some mm -hmm. breeding and that there may be multiple breaks yeah. or along what is supposed to be a ring. So it's theoretically possible. Theoretically, there was some evidence for a plant, a spurge, which formed a ring around the Car Caribbean Sea. So, like, there have been examples cited in various animals... There's a whole list on the Wikipedia page. Check it out and look into them if you're interested. But basically, most of the big examples have also been followed with research that goes, yeah, but maybe not. Yeah, the the, the consensus seems to be that theoretically that's possible, but we haven't found any surefire definite examples of that in nature. They all seem to be a little off. And the the common thinking among many people is that that's just not a stable situation for speciation. That that setup is not quite defined enough, quite uh, long-lasting enough yeah. to reliably speciate an animal, create two species. Yeah, it's theoretically possible, but unlikely that you're going to have the right conditions for long enough for that to develop. Yeah, so to answer your question, yeah, maybe... Kinda. <laughs> I, I would wonder if we could do it in a, in a laboratory setting. Yes. If you could get, I don't know, flies or something, you know, some quick reproducing model organism that you could set up populations that way and see, like, across the lab. Mm -hmm. They'd each have, like, a little doorway and you could, like, open the doors at different times during breeding seasons and see if you could develop mm -hmm. a, a artificial ring species to show that it's possible. But yeah, it seems like it's just an unlikely thing to settle. Yeah. When it's the, the point about the, the straight line, the issue there is I think 
important because there may be times where it has happened across a continent, but how would you, how would you confirm that's what happened? Right. And was also, that what caused it or was it other things? Also, if you're around a mountain, you ha you are all in a much more similar environment mm -hmm. than if you're across a continent. Like if I'm yeah. thinking the U.S., you, you know, for example, North America, for example, that's a lot of different environments you're cutting through yep. from coast to coast and you're not likely to have a contiguous. Con yeah, exactly. So to answer your question, yes, in theory, that could yeah. happen. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, yes. Thought experiment, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Lab experiment, maybe someday. In real life, we, we've yet to find seems tricky. Good evidence for it practically happening. Yeah. But a good question. Ring species. Check out yeah. check out ring species for those who are interested. A fun concept. Well, thank you for that question, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thanks to who everyone who requested eggs. Thanks to everyone who listens and follows us and is our patron and everything absolutely keep an ear out for more news on dragon con stuff as we hear it we'll let you know yep and send in those ideas for 95 and 100 they're Please coming up do and thanks for listening everybody we'll see you next time we release episodes every fortnight so you'll see us then you'll see us in two halves of a fortnight <laughs> <laughs> bye everybody bye Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.